evening, everybody. It's Saturday evening edition of Alfonso Investments Weekly Recap with the Morning Show. For those of you who tune in on the Morning Show each and every weekday, I'd like to thank you. But I know your time is valuable, and you folks can be busy, and not everybody gets a chance to check out the Morning Show live as it happens. So I'm going to start taking a look at stories that we covered each and every weekend and look back and put together a couple of minutes for you folks. A couple of stories that I thought were worth mentioning that we spoke about quite early on in the week. Now, I know what happens. Weekend comes and you're looking to get your Magic the Gathering news. You look back in the comments section, you see, man, if I had have only seen that coming, Early on in the week, maybe I could have done something about it. Maybe I could have ordered something that's now out of stock. That tends to happen. So on morning stocks and talks, we cover a lot of cards. And there's a few things that we covered this past week and dug into detail and picked up on as far back as MagicCon Philadelphia when talking about Dan Dan. So we've got a good article that rocks. Here, we spoke about it on Wednesday this past week. Here's a highlight of one of the episodes of Stockton Talks from Wednesday morning. This is your weekend recap. For those of you, thanks for joining us. Let's take a look at this article. All right, interesting article from the stock desk here this morning. And I think it's quite fair to say I was bombing around on the Twitter the other day. I was. And then this guy, there's a guy on the Twitter tweets and the tweet elites and the bots and the boo beeps and he was talking about magic con philadelphia um so i'm i'm bombing around on twitter and this is right before the pre-advent of magic con philadelphia happens and i see this guy and he's tweeting and he goes i'll be at magic con philadelphia and i'm playing dan dan if anybody wants to join me and i'm like dan dan cool he's playing a deck with dan dan in it and i was like so then I started looking into the comments and people started commenting and I'm like, well, I know what that card is. It's like the big four one fish. Right. And uh, then I looked into it a little farther and I was like, Hey, this is something to this. This is like another format. It's like a made up format and it seems kind of funny. So I looked at the rules and from what I could tell, the rules are such that two players sit down to play a Dan Dan deck and we both share the same deck. And the win condition in the deck is Dan Dan. That's the only like win condition in the deck. And then there's a bunch of other spells in there, but you sit down and you play with your opponent off the same deck and you try to cast Dan Dan and kill your opponent with Dan Dan. So then uh, just a day or two later, I'm reading along and bombing along on the stock desk and checking out articles for used folks. I remember hearing about the Dan Dan last July, right? That format, right? Tommy Siddons knows what I'm talking about. So I heard about it. It is a format. So let's read on it for today because this novelty format has resurgent, has caused a $1,500 price spike. And that format, in case you didn't know, is Dan Dan. So within the world wide, within the let's read this article for you folks today, but within the wide world of Magic the Gathering, there are a ton of formats for players to play. Well, the most popular of these at the moment is undoubtedly Commander, which exploded in popularity over the recent years. Now, dominating the financial markets, Commander is even leading the future of Magic the Gathering in the new eternal world design philosophy. Despite The recent surge in popularity, Commander is hardly the only format Magic the Gathering players enjoy. Standard, Modern, and even Legacy aren't going away after all. Is your name Dan? We don't have any members of the channel named Dan, but if we did, this stream would be for you. Hmm. A little sip of coffee, tasting good. So let's talk about Dan Dan, this format that's causing a single card in the the game to spike by 1,500%. And besides... Along these official formats, many Magic the Gathering players have connected or concocted their own bizarre rules and formats to maximize their fun. See, these are smart people. Let's read that again because I like this part. If you want to get the fun in your collection, we want to maximize the fun value. There are multiple Magic the Gathering players that have concocted their own bizarre rules and formats to maximize their fun. The Wacky Races format 
which turns Magic the Gathering to a racing game. Never heard of it, but now I have to check it out. It's very recent and dramatic example of this is considered that Magic has been around since almost 30 years. And so unsurprisingly, not all players made formats that are new. Shout out to MTG Gaming Bob and Commander Raids. The utterly baffling Forgetful Fish format, for instance, has existed since at least 2016, although it's never been too popular. Thanks to a recent video, however, that may all be about to change. The Forgettable Fish Dan Dan and the story of it. So I'm going to post a link to this article if you guys want to go there and you want to check out the... You want to check out the uh, video for yourself, I suggest you do it. I haven't even looked at it yet. I just wanted to read this and share it with you folks here today. I did a little research on Dan Dan because I wanted to figure out exactly what it was. Time Capital says, quit playing long ago, but quit collecting a few sets ago. I come here for the commentary and the fun, right? Time Capsule, loving the fun. So if you want to know what's new and you want to talk about what's going on and you want to talk about some fun formats, like let's check out this Dan Dan format. Recently brought back into the limelight by MTG YouTuber Ristic Studies. Forgetful Fishing is an absolute bizarre player made format, originally the brainchild of MTG player Nick Floyd. The Forgetful Fish revolves around the deck of the same name, constructed not around just one, but ten copies of the Arabian Knights card Dan Dan. What? Yeah, there's 10 copies of this fish. It's safe to say that Forgetful Fish is a little bit strange and the weirdness doesn't end there. However, as within for th Forgetful Fish, both players use the same 80 card deck. Okay, so a little more information is an 80 card deck. We both play off the same deck and like anybody could build this deck because anywhere you play it, it's going to be the same. Alongside the mandatory 10 copies of Dan Dan, the Forgetful Fish deck also includes eight copies of Memory Labs. Floyd explained in their design document that these two marquee cards give the deck its name, similarly to much of the rest of the official Forgetful Fish decks. These two cards aren't incredibly powerful or exciting. After all, Memory Lapse is a tepid counterspell, which is has niche appeal, and Dan Dan's unquestionably a weak card, boosting for one stats and the requirements that you have your opponent has an island to play to attack with Dan Dan is borderline unplayable, but within the Forgetful Fish format, however, this unassuming fish has been given a new lease on life. Beyond just having a funny name, the Forgetful Fish format offers an incredibly tactical and compelling gameplay experience as though this unique control mirror match, players are constantly fighting over the top of the deck. While Dan Dan may be the namesake card, it's undoubtedly the core of the Forgetful Fish experience, facilitated through cards such as Predict or Brainstorm. Forgetful Fish matches can be staunchy, competitive, and tactical. They should go on long enough. Forgetful Fish even results in games where you or your opponent get decked out in a spectacular fashion. So stir surging in popularity here. Let's look at the card here. Here's the card. This is like, if you look in the background and we're not talking about the boats as much as we would. There's these two boats here. Brody's looking at the couple of bateaux here. That's the French content for the day here. They bon, the bateau. Le carte de bateau, right? That's our French content moving up the uh, YouTube algorithm due to inclusivity of Canadian content. Got these two boats, but Dan Dan's actually this fish that's below the surface coming up in between the boat. So don't be fooled by this. Anger Collection's in the house. How you doing, buddy? Dan Dan cannot attack unless opponent controls any islands in play. Dan Dan is destroyed immediately if at any time you have no islands. So this is a 4 1. And we got the Memory Labs card. There's like 10 copies of this. Counter target spell. That spell is countered this way. Put it on top of its owner's library instead of into the graveyard. So. You're memory lapsing your opponent's Dan Dan constantly. You put it on. You're fighting over the top of the deck. While the Forgetful Fish. Okay, so yeah, I guess the namesake of the deck was Forgetful Fish before it was Dan Dan because you got the memory lapse and Dan Dan together. So you cast the Dan Dan, you fight over the resolution of the spell, and then you put it on back top of the library that you both share. The matches can be fierce as players. For control of the top of the deck, it's surprisingly easy to play, requiring just one deck and a pair of dice to track health, a comp comprehensive rules guide. This forgetful fish is remarkably accessible, and thanks to this forgetful fish deck, it can easily be brought out during an FNM to kill time or just fun. Ultimately, thanks to this accessibility and eccentricity, forgetful fish has been beloved by niche players 
since its creation following the recent video from Rustic Studies. However, this niche has exploded in popularity. I think it's going to explode in popularity now that Brody's mentioning it. That's what I'm about to say. So having painted the format as an incredibly enjoyable experience, players were eager to try it out. Who just that? Many Magic the players have taken to the card sellers as such as TTG Player and to snap up their copies of the namesake card. Unfortunately, for excited players, this was much easier said than done as the supply of Dan Dan is rather meager. It's an Arabian Nights card. It's partly in thanks to the card's most recent reprint being Time Spiral back from 2006. As barely playable draft chaff, it's understandable that a few copies of this niche card have been preserved throughout the years. Subsequently, that's all the rage. Actually getting a hold of Dan Dam has become quite the feat. Initially, before Rhystic Studies released their video, copies of Dan Dan could be easily purchased for 40 cents, if not less. However, the prices of these cards have skyrocketed over the 15 times their original value and are now sitting at $6. The majority of Dandan's printings were completely sold out, leaving only original Arabian Nights copies, and due to their age, these prized Dandan copies are even more, sitting at $13. Limitless potential. So sadly for the forgetful fish, players looking to turn their decks into profit Dandan Dan is the only card that's spiking hard, being substantially more modern and frequently reprinted than other forgetful fish cards. Simply too common becomes expensive outliers. Curiously, when devising a new format in 2016, it seems Nick Floyd knew this would happen. As to mitigate the need to rush out and buy Dandans, Floyd included a sextuplet of proxy Dandan Dan tokens within their design documents. Should the supply of Dandans not return to normal anytime soon, thankfully, Magic players interested in the format aren't completely out of luck. As throughout their video, Brody Alfonso is highlighting how the one of the format's great strength is its numerous variants. While many of these alternate deck lists utilize the same core structure as the plethora of Dandans, a plethora, this is two days of plethoras. We have a plethora of news here for you folks. There are some outliers. Reddit users, for instance, pioneered a mono black variant of the format that's built around Icarid, and similarly, LGS owner Ryan Orberturf has proposed a Boros Burn version of the shared deck concept. Ultimately, whatever your preference is, it seems the Forgetful Fish format is an incredibly novel and compelling experience, and one that's certainly worth giving a try. Haven't tried the Dan Dan format. We got to talk about it in depth and how it works and how the gameplay is covered early this week and some people remember that format and discussion from the week before it was on the movers and the shakers list and i looked through the comment section and even the moxman was talking about dan dan this weekend the number of sales that it was making in the comment section sometimes when people are looking to try and pick up copies and saying they I wish they had heard of it sooner. Well, I try to bring some of these news articles to you as early as possible, as possibly can. There's a plethora of interesting stories out there. We cover everything from banking to cryptocurrency. We even talked about Dogecoin on Thursday last week, just a little bit, why that was moving. and But another card that made stories this week was the Herald of Hoofprints and a you saw uh, Weekend Cartoons with Brody video this weekend. There was a card in there, the Knights of Thorn, that we had in from the bottom 10 preserve list cards that no one cares about. And we did get a chance to do some live coverage on the spoiler of the Herald of Hoofbeats just the other day. Let's take a look at that coverage that happened later in Thursday's afternoon stream, uh, Morning Stocks and Talks last week. As anything, you, you you know, you can, it just comes in as a 2-2. And then you get to, like, copy on the next turn. So, like, other than clone or doppelganger that comes in as a copy of something, Cryptoplasm is kind of good because it's like a, it's like a 2-2 two -two on its own, right? It's pretty good, all right? Not too pretty bad for that one here. All right, well, what else, what else can we do? What else can we grab here? We got Cryptoplasm, always fun. Need multiple horse dudes. 
and I need them now. Yeah, it's fun, cheap coffee buster. I love it. It's a good one. Okay, got Cryptoplasm, got Erratic Portal, we got the Sakashima, the Imposter. All right. We're building new decks with Tribal. So, like, there's a couple... These are a couple of Benson gave me, all right? Good card here. This is, uh... Was it the Cavalier? This guy, Kinsbill Cavalier. Like, what do you think of this? This is a Benson pick, right? Let's bring up the Kinsbill. This card's very Cavalier from Morning Tide. I like it. Check it out. Night creatures you control have double strike. If this hasn't spiked already, it's probably going to. Right? Is it sold out? Yeah, it's sold out at the vendor shop. But this Kinsbill Cavalier gives your knights double strike. So you get to go night night with these two, right? Kinsbill, two strikes with the Kinsbill Cavalier. It's a little more Cavalier than other cards out there. Not too bad, not too bad. All right. So what are we playing with our hoof beats? You can hear the hoof beats already. All right, we got the Herald. What do we got? Amorphous Axe? You want to take a chop at something there, Mr. Four Keeps? What do you got, Stefan? Let's check it out. Chopping away with your Amorphous Axe already. Right, were we throwing some Amorphous Axe in there? Let's check it out. Amour. Bows. Let's get some Axe. What's this? A Commander card. Artifact. Quick creature gets 3-0 and is every creature type. Now there's a card. That's that's a good card. Everything's a knight. Ooh, from Lauren. Oh, Lauren foil. I want to go for the foil. Rune stalactite. All right, let's check this out. Lauren foils. You now you speak in my language. Stalactite. Let's get that. $5.99 this in foil original lauren equipped for one mana equipped creature gets one one and it's every creature type that's really good herald of hoof beats card combinations and possible deck builds that we covered there on the live stream another interesting card that made a lot of talk this week on the internet people discussing that card in particular Another card that I liked discussing a couple of weeks ago on the MTG Roundtable when it was spoiled over there with Superfast Tortoise, Prime 406 Games, and MTG Gaming Bob. But check out this clip that we have here for you folks where we're looking at an article on Fairy Mastermind, a card that started to get a little bit of attention while it was spoiled. Coming out yeah, this year, it's going to try to rival the ledger shredder spot and we found an interesting article from harvey mcginnis as we talked about it this card is now available on pre-order and it may be something you want to consider looking at we discuss how good the card really is and if it's going to be making waves here in commander and i like i just couldn't get it out of my i've been out of my head i've been out of my mind how could i ever think this time that you could ask him for a fairy mastermind okay i was out of my head i was out of my mind i was comparing ledger shredder to the fairy mastermind at that time because well quite frankly you heard me sing it brody's out of his head and he's out of his mind i'm like for two mana for one blue and one what are we going to get is it going to upset the apple cart as it comes to modern well, we're going to talk about it here today because our friend Harvey McGuinness is giving us another article from the stock test. No, wait, it's from Commander's Herald. Thanks, Harvey, for writing some more magic. Putting pen to the paper for the viewers here all joining in on the channel. March of the Machine spoilers in full swing, but perhaps one of the most interesting and important cards in the set Brings to CEDH has already been out in the public for a while now. That's the Fairy Mastermind. The breakdown on this card is means. Mastermind is an efficient blue creature that brings with it three key components. It has flash. It has a static ability with a key line of text that says draw a card. And 
It has an activated ability which can serve as an infinite mana sink when the need arises. So let's break down this card line by line so as to understand what exactly Fairy Mastermind has to offer. First, on the casual build on the cast ability of Fairy Mastermind, at two mana, one colorless and a blue, the Mastermind has a casting cost that's one of the more flexible and playable utility creature effects. It simply isn't a free spell to cast, but neither is any particular difficult mana investment. Dark Confident, Ledger Shredder, Gilded Drake, these are all examples of creatures which share a similar cost structure as Fairy Mastermind and have been able to flourish as a result. The Fairy Mastermind may not be as efficient as Esper Sentinel, but that extra generic mana in its cost brings with it quite a lot of value. There's also a crucial timing component to evaluate when casting Fairy Mastermind at two mana and in blue. Mastermind occupies the same mana value of the most expensive counter spell that you'll be spending mana to cast, at least. Making the flashy ability incredibly important here. This means that while you're holding up two blue mana, the rest of the table has to play around the possibility that you could cast Counterspell in response to their threats. As such, while it may be a better value play to cast Fairy Mastermind in response to an opponent drawing their second card for the turn, still as to trigger its effect, more on that part later, the ability to bluff interaction is valuable if not more so than a single Mastermind trigger. Mastermind is a card that's going to be cast in a lot of opponents' end steps, and it's in color identity that makes this one of the card's greatest strengths. So as we discussed on the round table last Thursday, uh, or two Thursdays ago when we were doing the spoilers, this card has the same mana pips as Ledger Shredder, a blue and one. It's tempo, and we'll get to the tempo discussion on it in a bit. It's a tempo card, and it does exactly that. If you're holding up blue mana to cast this card, you're basically representing Counterspell while you've got a creature in your hand. Next on to the reason we'll be casting Fairy Mastermind, the triggered ability. Whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn, you draw a card. Fairy Mastermind is going to be drawing us a lot of cards. So theoretically, this triggered ability represents the opportunity to draw 12 cards per turn cycle, assuming each player is already drawing two cards a turn. That is, while this ceiling is something I doubt many people are ever going to see in a game, it's worth noting just how easily Mastermind's ability can trigger. So Mystic Remora, Esper Sentinel, Ristic Study, either of Blue Form's commanders, T Timna the Weaver, and Krom Ludovic's Opus, all of these are permits which can repeatedly meet Mastermind's trigger requirement, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Any wheel also draws us three cards from each opponent triggering Mastermind, highlighting how we can also force our opponents to trigger Fairy Mastermind, netting us some excellent card draw. So quick, why break up the party? All right. Was that a fun article to go over? A little bit of discussion about Fairy Mastermind, a card that we peeked at in the spoilers over on the round table a couple of weeks earlier and was, again, making a lot of topics and discussion in the week last week. Dan Dan, a card that I know people are talking about still this weekend, something that we covered, Fairy Mastermind and the Herald of Hoofbeats. But whether we're talking about finance as a result from banking or cryptocurrency or magic cards, the price of Hasbro stock and how it all connects together, how you can get the fun preserved into your Magic the Gathering collections, Check out this clip from earlier this week where we discuss cryptocurrencies, microtransactions, using Web 3.0 to buy magic cards online. And nobody's really talking about this. And I had a really good time clearing up any misconceptions about that type of thing that any of you folks might have. A little bit of discussion on a morning live stream for all the viewers who were able to tune in. I really enjoyed it and have a good time. Let's take a look at this clip here on Web 3.0, cryptocurrencies, purple mana, and how to buy magic cards using the most advanced payment system available in the world today. Let's check it out. This website right here, purple mana. Okay, write this down. I'm going to school you folks here this morning because I love you. I want you to know about this, and you should know purplemana.com. Okay. 
here's a magic card site you can buy cards with crypto okay any cryptocurrency out there that you have directly in your website wallet use this card this is web 3.0 this website uses web 3.0 because you can get it, you can get an account here. You can join our community. You can buy any of these magic cards on here, and you can do it right out of your web wallet. You don't even need your credit card. You don't need to send them money. Nothing. You can pay for it directly from your web browser using a wallet extension, and that is Internet 3.0. Okay, if you guys have never heard of it, you're hearing for you're hearing about it here this morning on the bro show and this is the show the best darn magic the gathering show in the world in the planet nigh the multiverse and i challenge anybody else who is out there who's made a video and has talked about this because nobody's doing it and why am i doing it because i want you folks to get the fun into your collection and i want you to know how to buy and sell magic cards in the most advanced ways that are out there on the market and this is one way to do it web 3.0 now what is a micro transaction when you buy these magic cards here you know you can log in and you can go and you, you know toy around go visit purple mana for yourself don't take my word for it for anything go there yourself and check this out okay you might want to, if you need a hand, give me a message on the Discord later. I'll walk you through it. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty easy to do. Anybody can do it, but security. Uh, Web 3.0 is the use. Let's, let's look and see what the internet doodle says about it. Okay, yeah. Web 3.0 uses blockchain technology, and it uses... Web 3 is an idea for a new iteration of the World Wide Web, which incorporates concepts such as decentralization decentralization blockchain technologies and token-based economics so some technologists and journalists have contrasted it with web 2.0 wherein they say data and content are centralized in a small group of companies sometimes referred to as big tech so web 1.0 was html basic read-only web pages blog posts email going back and forth just very simple web web 2.0 is what most of you guys are used to using third-party payment servers such as paypal and other any other see the only people who are allowed to take payments and send payments on the interweb are those who are like approved like by you know by agencies let's just say that but web 3.0 is decentralized each individual just like when you go to the hotel and you you're like can i use your lobby computer to check my email you go down there and you sign into your own uh your own email account your gmail you go okay what's my gmail address what's my password sign in now you're that one user and you can see your email with web 3.0 any of your wallet extensions that you have in your toolbar will come up Say you're, uh, say you're out, say you've got this all set up, right? You're uh, me and Michael Superbacker, we're partying on Hawaii hard. We're just like giving her and like, we're hanging out with Tommy sit-ins and Ed, the dual brain. We're just chilling out. And then we like, there's a magic card that's on our radar. We're like, I want to buy it. Right. I don't even have my wallet out on my credit card out. I, I just go, I log into a computer, any computer and these wallet extensions can come up. And they're linked directly to your personal uh, browser account. And now you can start, you know, you can go over to Purple Mana and you can like pick up any of these magic cards and pay for them directly out of your browser. So, yes, coach, Web 3.0 uses blockchain currency and blockchain. So, anybody who watched, a, um, I'm calling this out because I don't like it when people talk, and I would never mention this unless somebody started spreading bad information out of it i want you guys to have some good information this is a example of the now the fees associated with this okay so say for example say for example you use paypal or you use card kingdom or you use any of the current payment processors for web 2.0 you're gonna get a fee so that little bit of money that paypal charges you that is an, but the only way they can do it because they're not using web 3.0 web paypal's not web 3.0 Pay, paypal's web 2.0 because it's like a conglomerate of tech companies that get to decide who gets to make payments right so they take a fee and then they just add that on top and then at the end of the month they charge you micro transactions are transactions that are very small using web 3 technology blockchain and the internet of things 
to make very small transactions for very small fees. So when you make this, say, for example, when you make this purchase over a purple mana, because you want to buy some magic cards, you want to buy some Snapcaster mages, you want to buy some Talarian academies, you want to buy some lion's eye diamonds, you want to pay for it with crypto, you can do it here at Purple Mana. And if you got Web 3.0 activated in your browser and like the little transactions, like the fee, you can send you can send money back and forth for very little and very fast and for very little next to no fees. And that is a micro transaction. And that was one of my favorite moments from this last week's morning stocks and talks. A live stream i really enjoyed discussing something that i don't think anybody else is quite discussing out there in the world of magic cards can't wait to do a follow-up to the follow-up on that video if you check the weekend cartoons episode this week it was a shout out to a real great youtuber that's been supportive and very creative in his designs and his magic the gathering content Thanks, Super Fast Tortoise. In that mail opening video, we were picking up some cards from the bottom 10 that happened like a couple of weeks ago, maybe even last month's bottom 10. And there was a lot of discussion on some buyouts that happened this week past. And I really like it when people are buying out cards from the bottom 10 that happened the week before. I think it's quite hilarious when people start talking about them and they're already on their way. And I hope that you folks get a chance to look at the bottom 10 from last month and this month and take a look at what you see and what's going in in the market here this week. And I know if you folks can't catch the live streams early in the morning as this stuff is happening, because things happen. And if you go to the internet to try and get your Magic the Gathering news on the weekend, you might find out things are happening so fast these days that you just can't keep up. I like to bring you folks some of these highlights from this past week and put them together in my favorite highlights of the first week of April. Morning Magic the Gathering stocks and talks on the live stream. Thanks to all the folks who got to tune in early and join and participate in some of the chat i enjoy doing that with you folks and it makes it all a really good time and everybody who's observing the easter holiday this weekend have a happy one and have a little chocolate uh maybe not too much chocolate but uh thanks for joining me for this recap we'll talk to you all again soon